vlog. It's not really a vlog. It's more of a conversation. Um, and just advice of what I experience in my life. So, you know, as like the recent, I'm not even going to say allegations because they're true, um, have come out. Y'all know about the whole Diddy thing. Um, I kind of wanted to shed some light on like my experience from abuse. I've spoke about this before. Um, and then if you do follow me for my weekly vlogs, I do talk about, I don't really talk about it, but I do have DV in my profile for domestic violence um, because I do like to spread awareness um, as I am a DV survivor. And also I didn't want my page to be solely about domestic violence. So when I was starting off my page, um, I had thoughts about making it all domestic violence and then I got people's feedback and a lot of people were just like, no, because then your page would be really sad. So that's one reason why I don't just specify or solely talk about domestic violence. It's essentially lifestyle vlogs and just things that I do in my everyday life. And this vlog, I was actually going to wait <clears throat> to put out, but with videos coming out and just more and more people in the comment section are like clueless as to certain rules and regulations and laws and they don't really research it which I can understand you probably wouldn't if you've never you know been through something like this before I know I never did um <clears throat> I feel like I should share my story and kind of tell people like what you should do if you or if you know of someone that are currently in this situation and just for future advice so that you know in case you're dating around or anything like that um so yeah my name is Nicola Michelli welcome back to my channel if you're new here welcome I do not talk about this all the time um but this is my story so get ready with me okay so first I wanted to start off and say that uh as I'm getting ready you guys um I wanted to say that I was in a domestic violence situation that started off in like, whew, time frame, let's see, 2013. Um, I don't even think I was 21 yet. I think I was 20, about to be 21. Um, and so, so let's get into the story. And so, <clears throat> started off okay like everybody typically says it starts off okay um and then I would start to say like there were some red flags in the beginning like if you notice that a person's living with like another roommate and like they're of age and what I mean by of age is they should be established by that age because this person was like eight years older than me maybe more I think it was more than that y'all I'm pretty sure it was more I can't recall anyways <clears throat> that doesn't matter um, and I'll just say this, like you, you're never invited into the home. You never, um, meet this roommate for a long period of time. That's a red flag. That's a, that's a big red flag. Um, <clears throat> it just gives off bummy. <laughs> okay. Let's get on with this story. It's not a funny one. It's not a fun one. Um, just wanting to shed and spread awareness um so yeah I'll say that if somebody like wants to move in with you like rather quickly that's a red flag like in under a year that <laughs> huge red flag um but for some people it works I'm just gonna say that do your research and like definitely do a background check on people because people these days are just scary um and it's gotten worse too so imagine me in, what was it, 2013, not running a background check. So I'll say another, <clears throat> let me just get into my story. I feel like I'm rambling on. Okay, so met this person through a mutual friend, um, noticed that they had a roommate um, and never met the roommate, um, was never invited like into the home or anything like that. Uh, and then I was eventually invited into the home, but the roommate was not there. So that was kind of weird. But there was like no female items around. So yeah. Um, so anyways, fast forward to 
some time went by um and then we eventually move in together and that's when the red flags really started to show so it'll be things like oh we would go pick up his kids and <clears throat> he's wanting to fight like the stepdad on the front lawn and i'm like you're like 32 why are you why are we trying to fight on the lawn so anyways <clears throat> yeah there was that um and it was just like the reasoning behind everything just didn't make sense. It was like, oh, I don't like him trying to dictate things that my kids can and can't do. And I would ask, oh, well, what is that? And like, you could never get like a valid answer. If you can't explain to me why you're upset and you're really wanting to fight a grown ass man, another grown ass man on the front lawn, then what are we doing? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> that just didn't make sense to me. Um, and so then it would be you know I never asked like why him and his ex were like split up or anything like that but I did notice that um every time we would go get the kids she would like come outside and the step the stepdad or like her husband he wasn't even the husband at the time the boyfriend at the time would stand at the door to like watch everything that was going on so I thought that was really weird and that was another reason why he like wanted to fight him because he was like why do you keep watching what we're doing the exchange between our kids so ladies don't get mad that's a red flag um that was at least a red flag in my case and so when I tell you guys it happened every single time like if the stepdad was not home then we were not able to get the kids like <laughs> I didn't put two and two together but it makes sense right right okay so fast forward to us moving in together and like the kids were there it would be little things like um you didn't load the dishwasher properly excuse me what who gets mad over that i don't know some people might but when i tell you i watch <laughs> to what makes sense to me um i would logically <laughs> in my brain load the dishwasher cups at the top plates at the bottom <laughs> pans at the bottom if they don't fit wash it by hand right yeah I would even ask how do you want it like loaded he would explain it to me and I'm like that doesn't make any sense but whatever do you and I'm gonna do me yeah huge red flag if someone gets mad at you for loading the dishwasher wrong I can see if it's like just pans at the top and I mean if everybody's dishwasher is different who anyways that was a red flag in my case so there was that hold on I need to wash my hands and get this off okay we're back um so yeah we left off with the whole dishwasher thing let's just say by the end of that night and like we had his kids that night and they were sleeping in our second bedroom um he was so upset that he physically pushed me to the ground got on top of me and slammed my head against the kitchen floor and I went unconscious for a little bit and then he proceeded to strangle me and the kids walked out and saw everything that was happening so when I came to um the police was called I believe the downstairs neighbor had called the police and overheard like what was happening <clears throat> and so uh you guys during this time let me tell you guys that his dad stupid neighbor his dad was what is it called in Oklahoma I think it was like sergeant police um I forgot what he was considered it was a he was a manager so uh, his name was so uncommon I'll put it that way the last name was so uncommon that he was able to get out of situations that other people are not typically able to get out of legal situations so he was able to use his name because he had his dad's name and the police would literally like just let him go inside with him like I'm not even kidding like it happened on multiple occasions um that was the first incident that really transpired after that this was about a year in um after that it resulted into things like timing me doing my makeup uh 
how long it took for me to do it from when I got up and went into the bathroom and coming out every single day um, to asking me why I'm wearing certain makeup and then judging like my clothes and what I'm wearing like if I wore a skirt to work I wasn't allowed to wear a skirt if I had a blouse on a certain blouse that he didn't like the blouse was getting ripped and I could never wear it again if y'all know like females we have like lacy bras and this is not lingerie it's literally just like uh one of the good bras that are under wire without padding right like if you have boobs then you you understand um you don't need padding and stuff and so sometimes it's it was you know it's full coverage and so I would wear that I wasn't allowed to wear that <laughs> under my clothes so stuff like that um is what I'm like referring to that is a huge red flag um there were instances where I was like pushed into um the wall it was like the door behind um what was it our front door like the wall I was trying to leave one time after we got into an argument <clears throat> and he prevented me from leaving he pulled me back by my collar my shirt collar and pushed me into the wall and there was like a huge gash or dent indention into the wall like it I fell through it that's how bad it was so <clears throat> the police was called for that and um they literally were like oh he didn't do that he didn't do it how how else did it get there so no report was ever filed with that i asked for one and they just like played it off and was like oh you don't need a report we're not gonna write a report for this and he got out of that situation um let's see I'm trying to recall everything that happened because it was so long ago um there were situations where um I eventually like stood my ground because I got tired of like just being physically and mentally and emotionally abused um like my twin sister during that time we both lived in Oklahoma City and it was our 21st birthday and we wanted to go hang out together um <clears throat> And so he would like avoid, he would say things like, you can't go hang out with your sister. And I'm like, excuse me? So it became that like overwhelming that he would not allow me to hang out with my, with my twin sister. Um, <clears throat> so she didn't know what to do and it was that type of situation. I didn't really know what to do. And let me just say this, like sometimes people are not so naive that they don't want to go back. They just don't know how to get out of an abusive situation um <clears throat> for my case like I definitely was trying to leave and it felt like anytime I would try to take one step forward nobody would help me um to get out of it so <clears throat> I just felt helpless to be honest um so what I did was I put a plan together. You have to make a plan and you have to stay silent about it. You can't say anything to anyone. I don't care who it is. Um, <clears throat> and my plan, my mom, like they all, my mom, my dad, my twin sister, they all knew what was happening, but they didn't really know to like what extent, what was really going on and what I was enduring every single day of my life. So he was like oh I need to go to school and we were talking about moving to Texas so let's just move to Texas so in my my mind I'm like in my mind I'm like I'm not moving anywhere with you um and then as I kept like just thinking about it and I prayed on it like I stayed prayerful um I was like sure let's just let's let's move to Dallas let's move but let me rewind guys because I forgot to mention this part so in the beginning of our relationship like when we moved in together I was a part of a choir at this church that I went to and there was a girl that was there and she was giving her testimony and during her testimony I remember vividly like it was yesterday um she was crying and she said you know today marks my anniversary for leaving my abusive husband behind um and I was with him for eight years and I have full custody of my five children and they have no contact with him and she was just like explaining like how he would like beat her and degrade her and like curse her out and things like that and I remember specifically saying you guys and 
mark my words when I say this, never say never. I said, I looked at him, my abuser, because during this time he was not abusing me. I looked at him and I said, oh, that could never be me. That could never be me. Never say never, ever. I learned the hard way. Definitely learned the hard way. And I went through it. I ate my words and I went through it. I went through hell for those four and a half years. So yeah, let me fast forward to um, back to the story, not fast forward, sorry guys, I feel like I'm all over the place, but get back to the story at hand. So while we were in Oklahoma planning to move to Texas, at that time I put in like a victim's protection order because I was tired of like the physical abuse and I started collecting evidence <clears throat> to get the uh, emergency VPO permanent and me thinking that like his dad was going to be able to help me and stuff because of who he was and like his ties and the police every time I would call him he would always say I don't know why he does this I don't know why he acts like that and then I would like call his mom to vent some time hell there was times that I would go to his mom house and it was like four in the morning and I have bruises all over me and I'm crying and I'm bleeding and I'm like asking her, I'm like, what, what is this? Like, why is this happening to me? And y'all know the stories that I would get. Take note in all of this too, because their family is definitely not your family. And also sometimes, well, most times abusers, their families are enablers as well. They are, they have privy and knowledge to the abuse, but they won't do anything to help that victim, which is mind-blowing to me so I thought going through this the ball was like kind of somewhat in my court and I would get help nope that didn't happen I told him I said hey so what's happening is I'm calling the police and your son is using your name to get out of things and he was like well that's unacceptable that's against the law that can't happen it was happening was it stopping no it was not stopping so that's what I mean by their family is not your family and like his mom would be like, oh, y'all, I kid you guys not. The first time I went over there, oh, I thought he uh, grew out of this. I thought he was a changed man. I thought he was better. And red flag in my head, I'm like, excuse me, say what? Grew out of it. What do you mean? And she was like, oh, I shouldn't say anything. And I was like, no, you need to spill the beans. Like what? This is a known thing that he's known to do. You guys. His, his family knew all about it. So let me tell y'all. His mom was like, oh, well, he couldn't live with me anymore uh, because he pushed me up against the wall and choked me. You? As his mother? I'm like, if he can do that to you, he don't give a damn what he does to me. Y'all. When I tell you guys I was floored, I was fucking floored. I was like, how could you not have told me this? And she was like, well, it just wasn't like, it's just not for me to tell. Girl, what? What? <laughs> Y'all don't know how pissed off I was. Y'all just don't know. Like the this woman was taking pictures of me, keeping evidence for me. Like I, I entrusted her to a sense to a certain extent and then I'm learning like all of this like this happened to you when you kicked him out and I never knew any of this information so let's just say like after that she begged me not to tell him that she told me what happened between the two of them and why he could no longer live there and whenever like me and him did talk about it it would literally be about oh we just didn't get along there was no further explanation so red flag red flag um so yeah there was that uh and then another red flag was like the baby mama like we would whenever we would go get the kids like me and her became kind of like close in a sense 
uh, whenever we had our kids, she would only talk to me about their kids. And so come to find out, she was like, hey, please don't say something to so-and-so. And so she was, this is my ex, she was like, please don't say anything to him. Um, but just in case like y'all ever need to get the kids for whatever reason, I listed you as an emergency contact. Only you can pull the kids out of school, not him. And I, at that age, I was what, turning, tw I was 21 then at that time. And I was like, this is a lot of responsibility, but like, I really loved the kids and like, they were, you know, they're kids. And so I didn't have an issue with it, but I didn't look further or think to even when I did ask, cause I, I'm a question asker it was oh I just trust you more than him there was nothing further if that makes sense um and <laughs> she would never really you know go into full detail and so <clears throat> one time uh he was arrested for breaking the emergency VPO order because I was trying to leave like our apartment and he was ordered to stay away from it. And so I realized that he broke in when I was away at work <clears throat> into the apartment by kicking in the door. And so when he was there, I was like, okay, you know what, I'm gonna leave. So I guess he was scouting me out, knowing what time I usually get home. So I just didn't even go home. I turned around and by the time I turned around, the way that the apartment is made is you can walk through and you can like hide and peep and see when people come through. And then like, if somebody like goes around the corner you can cut through to like meet that person before they even make it back around that corner, if that even makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so when I saw that the door was like a jarred and kicked in and stuff and broken, I just left. And as I got in the car to leave, you guys, he <clears throat> proceeds to jump on top of my car while I'm driving away. So then he falls off, someone sees it and calls the police. And the police comes and they have him in handcuffs, but they don't take him away. One of the officers was like, um, this was still in Oklahoma at the time. Cause we remember we were preparing to leave, to go to, to Texas. And so one of the officers at the time, my plan at that time was to go to Texas by myself and without him. And so during that time while the emergency VP order was in effect, one of the officers came and interviewed me to find out what happened, why he flew off the car and stuff like that, and why he was even near me or why we were near each other. And um, let's just say that the end of that conversation resulted in him saying, oh, you'll never leave. Think like stuff like this, it always happens. Like we see it where the females never leave. And I'm like, if I'm sitting here telling you that I'm trying to leave, what is that saying to you? I don't understand what you're not getting through your thick skull that I'm in fear for my life you saw pictures and bruising there's an emergency VPO order that's clearly in effect and you're still not trying to help me and that's essentially how it went every single time so um Let's say after all of that has happened and I knew that the police just wasn't going to do anything, I essentially just like gave in. I couldn't really go back home permanently because of where like my family was living without going into too much detail. It just wasn't an option for me. Um, and I was the one paying rent there. <laughs> So I was the young, naive person that was like, this is BS. This is my house. This is my apartment. I'm going back there. Nobody can tell me what to do when I'm staying there. That was me. So I went back. Um, and uh, all in all, I allowed uh, this person to like get into my head and I dropped like the, the, I didn't drop the VPO order. I just didn't go to the finalized hearing for it uh, after seeing how I was like being treated by the police um and basically being told like how it's gonna go because those same officers were due to testify on my uh behalf as well with the incidents that they were um <clears throat> involved with that's how physically violent it got so yeah I just didn't go um and so essentially it was dropped and so during that time, like I was 
taking pictures and videos and stuff and like keeping all that information and like a diary on my first MacBook that I got when I was in college and uh like he found it and then threw my MacBook away in the dumpster I was also <laughs> writing a book on there which is crazy so I no longer have that info um and back then I didn't like have I don't think anything was backed up to my iCloud. I can't tell if this side is darker than the other. Eh, a little bit. But, um... But, yeah, so... I no longer have, like, my evidence with me. And then, like, the mom held on to like the physical copies of no no I also had physical copies of like the photos and stuff um and like the mom also had physical copies and he found both sets and threw them away so no longer had that evidence and literally had to start completely over um so I'll tell you guys, like, just from experience, always keep copies, record everything, like a video, sound, pictures of bruising, and if you can, like, videos of how you got them, um, or in the mix, and, like, keep it somewhere where that person can't, like, find it. If you gotta keep it at a friend's house, keep it at a friend's house, um, someone that you trust. If you gotta keep it at work in a cabinet of your own personal filing cabinet that has a key keep it there um that's what i would recommend um let's see what else to this story so yeah after that was all done um then the move finally came when it was time to move uh to texas so <clears throat> where's my Y'all, I need to wash my brushes. Like, it's not even funny. We just got back from vacay, though, so ignore it. Anyways, uh, the time came to, like, move to Texas. And so, finally moved. And I couldn't do it by myself. So, well, couldn't get out of the situation to do it by myself. So, like, my mom was, like, nervous and scared. And she didn't want me to move out here with this person because she knew everything that I was enduring and she was afraid that um, I was going to end up dead and she kept telling me she was like I just don't want anything to happen to you and she was like I just don't know what I would do um, if something were to happen and at that time I honestly just felt like I still didn't have help from anyone like I'm going through all this I'm explaining this to you and you're still not like trying to help me out of the situation that's how I felt um I'm like I look for solutions not I try I try to just look for solutions and not dwell on the problem at hand right because I'm going through this and I know I have to go through this until I can get out of it so that's what I was dealing with so yeah the move came um and it was I want to say it was like the first night um where is my brush at The first night there was like a huge incident where the police was called and I forgot what happened um, but needless to say <clears throat> like an argument uh, ensued and the police was called and like I had the whole video of like him choking me on the patio to the point where like the neighbors across from us could see it and even recorded the video so what is going on with my face? I'm not sweating. I don't know what that is. Um, and so, like, when the police came, like, then he was arrested. And they had mentioned that Texas, at that point, they had just put in a family protection law, I want to say, that was in place that said they have a zero tolerance for domestic violence against family members. And so they wanted to, like press charges on him but then when they started to like take pictures of us and stuff although they had the video of what was going on they actually put me in handcuffs because um they saw scratches on him in which I did not do 
did not. Um, and what they go off of is like the physical injuries to that person. And so during this, like I'm still learning everything, like the law and stuff pertaining to this type of, you know, incident or altercation at hand. I just never been involved, never knew someone that was involved. So I didn't know how any of this worked, but I knew that in Texas, he could not be protected by his father because he was in a different state. So there were different rules and laws that applied. Um, so my plan was to gather more information, um, everything that I was going through and like report it and keep like so much documentation that it was just like unfathomable. And so that's what I did. I kept like pictures, videos, the whole nine. Um, there were even like witnesses, um, to everything. And like some people, obviously they're going to be afraid to like come out and say anything because they're in fear of their own life, which you can't, at that time I was upset. I was pissed off. I was like, why would you even like say that you're going to do something you turn around and don't do it but at the end of the day like you can't get mad at that person because they also have a livelihood and they have to live too you can't rely on a friend even a stranger to come through for you you have to be able to pull your own weight in a sense um because it's your life not theirs so just take note on that too so don't always get mad if a friend or a family member doesn't come through um, to assist you when you need help in a situation like that because this depending on who the person is like your abuser you don't know how violent that person could actually get you don't want to put other family members especially if they have kids in that same situation to the point where they could potentially kill them um, that would be another devastation that I'm sure you mentally like could not handle as well So, there's that. Um, so, yeah, uh, during, like, the time that he went away during, like, the first night, um, I had contacted, like, his kid's mom because I ended up running, like, a background check and saw everything that transpired in his past with his kid's mom, in a sense. Like, they both had records, and I could tell from her record that it was clearly in defense to him because she had to protect herself but she had one because he ended up pressing charges against her and so let's just say in my situation like I stayed prayed up the whole time and um in my situation during that time when I was put in handcuffs due to like the cuts and stuff on his body and stuff um he ended up not wanting to press charges so they did not like book me or anything like that um so yeah i have to put some color back in my face from this trip because it looks a mess So when I had called like the kid's mom to find out like everything I saw in the background it was like she was arrested for I think one time she, it was like a DUI and like flipped the car and the kids weren't in the car but I think were the kids taken I don't think the kids were taken away either though um, but like it was due to them getting into like an argument of some sort and she was arrested because she was driving um, and then it was like another incident where she like stabbed him and got arrested for that um and it was like in self-defense so I had called her and talked to her about it and I was like why didn't you tell me that you went through this and being the age that I am now 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 that I'm 32 I get why some females will not come forward and say hey, this person is an abuser, you should watch her back because they also don't want to be retaliated against for ruining that abuser's relationship. And a lot of times the female um, and vice versa 
would not believe the ex. They they would sit they would literally sit there and say, Oh, that's not gonna happen to me. He wouldn't do that to me. He loves me. He's not gonna do that. Um or would literally sit there and like belittle the kid's mom or the person in general and say, Well, why did you stay that long if that were me? You know what I mean? Like you get so many different mixed emotions from diff different people. Um that I'm not going to say that they don't believe you, but I can't believe some people actually get mad instead of wanting to warn them. Because then when you do that, then the person's definitely going to go back and ask, like, the abuser. Um, like, this person just came and told me this, and that's going to cause issues between that person telling you that and that person. And then also the abuser is going to make it look like they never did X, Y, and Z to this person or try and blame it on them as to and justify their actions as to what they did. No. Mm -mm. So that's a lot of times why females don't speak up. And so I'll say from my experience too, that the reason why I wanted to go to court in the end, um, because... I wanted him to be behind bars so he couldn't do it to another person ever again. And so the crazy part is that my attorney was like, you know, unfortunately in these situations that there's always going to be a next person. There's nothing you can do. All you can do is get your story out and say how you survived. And hopefully they'll hear it from you or from someone someday and know the actions that they need to take, like what's okay and what's not okay in a relationship um, how to move forward, how to get out of it. Yes, there's going to be mental scars um, that you're going to have to suffer with and you're going to have to do the work to get better too. You're going to have to. It's not an easy thing to live with because there's going to be triggers um, and so many other things that go hand in hand with this. So anyways, let me get back to my story from when we first moved to Texas the first time he was arrested and then he was able to get out a couple days later. Um, <clears throat> essentially, I think they just did that to separate us because they were like, oh, well, if you don't have any place to go because you're both new to Texas, then one of you guys are going to have to leave. And so they ended up making him leave and not me. Um, so <clears throat> I also found out that if like a person has a, what is it? like any belongings in your home as little as a toothbrush that they own or mail coming to your address they technically live there so if you're gonna call like the police on an abuser make sure their belongings are removed and don't say anything about them having stuff there but also i learned that a person another person can vouch for that person and say that they have been living there so that's another thing i don't know how you would you know, go about getting out of that type of situation other than moving again and, you know what I mean, ensuring that people that you know and that people that live in that dwelling know that that person does not live there. Okay, so, um, let's see. So when he was able to get out, <clears throat> it was like things calmed down for a little bit. Like it, it didn't happen again for like a month or two. And he just promised to get better and he didn't. Clearly they never get better ever. So leave at the first sign. Um, <clears throat> and he was like, oh, let's go to counseling. Let's do therapy. Um, and so let's say the first time going to like a couple's therapy, with him, like the, he found the, uh, what do you call it? He found the therapist and that was my first time ever having to go to one. And so I didn't know what to expect, but I just knew that it was wrong because she explained how, and she was an older lady. She explained how her and her husband would get into fights, um, from time to time. Like he would call her out of her name and uh and uh she was like oh one time my husband slapped me and this was on our first like uh couples counseling therapy and I'm like excuse me what and the way that she said it just made it sound like it was justifiable and it's not so that to me was just 
crazy. I feel like you can't even see this. That to me was just crazy. So yeah. Um, after that, it was a thing where like, oh, I don't want to see a female. I want to see a guy. Um, females don't understand like how men think. That was another excuse. Um, let me see. And then just stop going in all overall. Um, another, what was it? Another incident had occurred to where the judge had told him he needed to, um, go to anger management. And like people can definitely get away with not really going to anger management if they're good with like talking that person out of actually having to physically go and um, like exchanging them for like money or bribing them essentially as long as they just like pay off uh, this person with whatever they're wanting then typically they don't have to, you know people don't have to go so that's what was happening with that um so let's see another what is this oh i need that i think i want it to be a little bit lighter still under my eye but let me see like a little bit and then blend it so yeah y'all um let's see I'm trying to think of <sighs> y'all there was so much I'm trying to keep everything in order anyways um after that incident then what happened uh another incident had transpired and it was like I got the hang of the or how the arguments would go and like anytime I would try to leave I was blocked um or he would like pull like the back of my collar like this so he's choking me and then he would twist it so then it got to the point where during this last go round, I started to learn just be naked just get out all get off Take off all of your clothes if you can't do that. He's going to have to try something else. So this this last time, I was butt naked. I was like, you're not going to choke me using my clothes. So we're arguing. He's throwing me across the room. Um, I'm running into the living room. He slams me into the coffee table. Um, and then you hear a knock at the door, and it's the police. And as the police is there... Uh, you hear them saying, cause they, I guess what they did was they, it sounded like what they did in the end, it sounded like what they did was, um, they heard him do what he did. Um, and then he tried to plead with them and say he didn't do it, but they could hear from outside of the door. It was so loud that the neighbor, you know, had called and this was a quiet neighborhood. It was an older establishment. Um, and so, um, as they're knocking and beating on the door, asking for us to open up, the police is like, open the door, like open the door, we hear you. And uh, he's like begging and pleading with me, please don't tell them that, um, please don't tell them that uh, I hit you, I didn't do anything, please put your clothes on. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. Like you fucked up, why, why, why? Like, no, I'm not doing that. And so, um he like pushed me to the ground again and like they heard it and so as they heard it they're saying are you okay are you like are you okay asking I guess essentially am I alive am I okay and I was like no and they said do we have your permission to enter and I said yes enter I'm in danger as soon as I said that they busted the door open busted the fucking door open and I was butt naked like <laughs> 
the police saw me butt naked. It was like four of them with guns drawn. And they immediately arrest him. And that was how I got free. So let me tell you guys after that. <sighs> then it was court. Um, during the time that they wanted to press charges against him, um, I did not press charges because I didn't want to be retaliated against. Um, cause he, he told me that if I were to ever press charges and if anything like this were to ever happen to where he would be taken away from his kids, he would kill me. He literally told me this. He was like, I promise I will kill you. This is the only thing I have left is my kids. And he was like, I'm, you're the only reason why I'm able to see my kids through my ex. Um, and so because of that, um, I was terrified. I was like, I'm not, I'm not testifying. So what they did is they ended up subpoenaing me. I can't even say it. They subpoenaed me to court. They made me testify on the stand on behalf of the state of Texas. Um, and so because of that, I had to go. And... <clears throat> And uh, I was scared shitless. And let me just rewind you guys because there's some things that I I forgot that transpired that um, actually needs to make it into the story so you guys can know just the like um, in depth of what I've had to endure. Like there will be times that um, when we first moved to Texas like my car stopped working and so I had to take the bus. I was working nine to six and I was literally living like in Addison, if you're familiar with Texas. Um, but my job was in Irving, which was about 15 minutes, give or take, to, work, to and from work by car. So since my car stopped working, I had to take the metro and the subway in. And so to do that, it was crazy long hour days. I don't know how I survived. It was literally nothing but the grace of God. I kid you guys not. Um, during that time, those times, I would have to be up by 4.20 a.m. And I have to be at the bus stop by 5 a.m. And then I would make a certain bus to catch another bus into Addison's bus stop. Um, and then at the Addison station, I would go from there to downtown. From downtown, I would go on the subway into Irving and then from Irving I would take another bus into a bus stop in Irving and then walk to my job which was like a seven minute walk from the bus stop my job like there were times that I would be so tired I would have to just waste money and take like a uber or lyft so I could sleep in at least until like 8 8 15 and get up later um, cause at this time I was still in school for my bachelor's degree. Like I, it, I don't know how I did this. I don't know. Um, and so, uh, while all that was like transpiring, there would be times where I would show up to work, like with my hair just like pulled out and like people knew what was happening at work. And like my friends, I, I call them my friends to this day. They're, they're still a part of my life and like they support me and they know everything I've endured. They went to my court hearings and stuff like that. Um, those are, those are my friends. Um, they were my coworkers at the time and they like saw what was happening. Like some, sometimes like you just know if you see a person and you know that they're usually together, um, and you know that they're off and like some things you just, you know that they're going through a physical relationship a physical and abusive physical <clears throat> relationship and so my boss like knew about it and there were times that I would ask him I was like can I please leave at least five minutes early so I can catch the bus and he would tell me no and so the only reason why I asked for this is because I would get home late if I missed the first bus because y'all know sometimes in Dallas the bus don't come on time and sometimes they don't come at all and even like the subway the the dart rail they don't show up or if something goes wrong they have to catch the next one right well there would be times I'm out there and it's freezing cold it's raining I have no choice but to sit there and wait for the next one um 
and I had to endure all of this I would just try to listen to music and just pray about it but then I would get home late I didn't get home till like on an average day it was like 8 almost 9 p.m but then there were times where it was like not anywhere from like 9 to I would say 9 to like 11 p.m based on the transportation system here in Dallas the public transportation system I would get my ass beat for coming home late like I'm not even kidding it was oh are you cheating on me are you what are you doing why are you getting home late where have you been and I'm like the bus didn't even show up like I, I text you and told you that and it would be you're cheating on me who are you cheating on me with like crazy stuff crazy stuff so just that alone it was like I was going home to hell going to work to hell having to like work and still go to school full-time it was a rough period in my life and I don't know how I survived it um so yeah so back to the current um what am I trying to say the current story to where he's now like we're about to go to trial to court and stuff and so my I was I would say attorney because she she essentially helped me out um although I had I was subpoenaed to do it she gave me like you know talking points but basically I gave her my case like she was like you have all of your documentation your videos you, we have the full story here and she was like all I could do was cry reading everything that you put like your statements aligned they never changed um she was like I'm so sorry you had to go through something like this um she was like you're not her exact words was you're not the typical person that we would expect on the stand um so in the end his attorney tried to um like take a plea deal with me she was like oh I won't make you get on this she told my attorney she was like I won't make you get on the stand if you um what was it if you agree to what was it only give him like two years and I was like, no, I'm not doing that. No, nope, I'm not doing that. And then my attorney was telling me that it's a huge risk going up on the stand because they're going to attack your character. They're going to attack every single thing about you um, just to get a reaction out of you. So please take note of that. They do, they do that to see if you're going to yell, scream, argue, shout. They're going to attack your character. And I do mean by all means necessary. They do not care. So when I say the law is on your side, they are essentially not on your side, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, during that time, uh, my attorney, she asked me when I was there, the state attorney, I'll say that because she wasn't really my attorney, the state attorney, asked me if when I was there she was like okay are you sure that you want to do this I thought it was mind-blowing that you're asking me if I'm sure that I want to do this and you guys subpoenaed me <laughs> but anyways I told her I said if it's gonna help put him away for a really long time so that he has a record he shows up as a felon in the system and he gets the years of what he deserves then I'm all for it that's exactly what I said to her and so um she said well uh, with cases like this, they could always just get, you know, like the bare minimum, which I think at that time was like maybe three, four years, um, based off of my case alone. And then she was like, but if he takes the stand, um, I cannot, she said, what did she say? Yeah. She said, if he takes the stand, I cannot cross examine him based off of his past until, he says it had to like he had to say something that would um <clears throat> what's the word what is the word <sighs> y'all I'm having a brain fart this is so annoying um oh my battery's dying hold on I have to change it oh ah! okay we're back um she was like unless he basically like chokes up on himself and like says something that would incriminate him from his past and he lies about it then I can cross-examine him based off of his past situation with his ex um but if he does not do that then we can't bring it in at all up in the court so uh, I prayed about it and by the grace of God like during this time during the court hearing um 
because I'm limited on time, guys, sorry. Um, he ends up taking the stand and he was like, I wrote her a letter. Can I please read it? And his attorney was like, I don't think that's wise. <laughs> um, and so he didn't read it. I don't believe, I don't think he read it. Yeah, he didn't read it. Um, and he acts like, twi he acts like twice. And then the judge was like, what do you have to say? And, uh, he ends up saying a little bit like, I'm sorry for X, Y, and Z. Uh, I'm sorry that I hurt you. Sorry. You know, just lies, just lies to get out of this. Um, so y'all don't, don't ever take the bait. It's all BS. They're never going to change. Um, so yeah, my, then it comes in, my attorney, uh, starts asking him questions and, he apologizes and she's like what do you mean by you apologize for like pinning her to the ground and choking her out um and he was like you know like I just got upset she was like oh so you have like a history of like getting upset huh and he was like no and she was like so have you ever been in trouble with the law before and he was like no and she was like you haven't and he was like no I've never been in trouble with the law before and she was like huh interesting because here in 2002 it shows that you were arrested for, I'm not going to say the baby uh, mama's name, but you were arrested for uh, physically abusing such and such on this given day. And you were, you actually served a sentence of 12 days. Like it was just, she started reading everything, like his record off. Like it was crazy. And all you saw was him getting pissed left and right, just getting heated. He's fuming. It was so bad. And I was like, this is it. He tried to incriminalize himself by do, by answering the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. So she's able to turn this against him and say, this is what I found in your record. And you're saying that you've never done this before. You just clearly lied. And now you're getting angry. Like it was crazy, y'all. Crazy. She went in. She went in and then she used all my photos. She shared the photos, um, had the videos. And he was just getting so upset, so upset. So then it was my turn to get on the stand and his attorney literally tried to come from my character. She tried to ask, why did I allow like, um, this person to be, why did I allow this person to be around minors? I'm like, they're not my kids. So how could you ask me a question like that? So it was like, y'all know how sometimes attorneys will be like, oh, yes or no. <sighs> well, I'm not the one you want to put on the stand and say yes or no to because I'm going to further explain why I did that to justify my answer. She didn't like that. She was like, yes or no questions. So I was like, no, I'm going to explain. So I continued to keep talking and she tried to talk over me and I just talked louder. But what I say with that is just don't get an attitude, but continue to keep going because you want people in the courtroom and the judge to know your actions as to why you did X, Y, and Z. And they all have to align to your statements. Like they're going to try and pull things out that don't make sense. That's going to lie make it seem like you're lying and twist your words, but you have to redirect them. In other words, gather their attorney and let them know you're not the one to play with. So I told her, and so that's when, you know, my when we had a break, I was uh, on the stand for an hour at that time. And then when we went back, I had to go back on for another hour. And uh, just more, I call it like insults, essentially. Insults after insults. So, because that's all they were doing is just trying to attack your character. And I told her, um, I was like, you're trying to attack me. But I, like he just stated when he was on the stand, I graduated with my bachelor's. I'm now in school for my master's. I hold a full-time job that I've worked at for four and a half years. What has he been doing? No degree, no, no job, no nothing. Um... And just a record, like a rap sheet of being physically abusive. And scamming the system. <laughs> so, all in all, these are the tips I'm going to give you guys. <sighs> Whatever you do, always record. Keep videos, audio, pictures. Keep it to yourself. Don't tell his family. If you trust someone in your family, tell them. If not, keep it to yourself until you have so much overwhelming evidence that it's outrageously crazy. Keep your statements aligned. You want to have a whole entire book. I had a file, y'all, this thick to take to that attorney. And in the end, because we were able to bring in the kid's mom domestic abuse, he got nine years. But 
the issue with that was COVID went into effect and they released him after two years and I didn't know about it until that third year he was free because the system miraculously worked then which didn't make any sense to me that's another thing like you can become a part of the vine program through the government or I'd say through the police department system and it's supposed to be like a victim protections aid and it it's useless they don't update you on nothing they don't help you they don't they don't update you on shit so what I always say is you need to have protection and what that means is if you're gonna go through something like this and you're confident that this is where you, what you want to do to get out of the situation and take them to court and get justice protect yourself arm yourself um i tend to like people that you know need to know about it know about the situation so you're not in harm's way just take care of yourself and always have evidence that's what i would say But the police is not there to protect you, so know that too. They will not protect you. I just wanted to show you guys the final look because I realized I didn't show you guys the final look but <clears throat> to end this off i just want to say hold your ground if you're in a situation with kids <sighs> please use that as your power to get out of a situation like that out of a domestic violence situation you do not want your kids to grow up seeing that stuff it haunts them forever um and it's enough that you, as a human being, have to endure it yourself. So, please get out of the situation the best way you know how. And do so strategically. Because telling the person does nothing but enrages them and piss them off. And they could potentially kill you. So... I hope I explained this story well I don't know but that was my experience and I'm rooting for you all especially if you or someone you know is in this situation give them this video share it with them maybe they'll pick up some insights I don't know but if you could also stitch this um I would love to hear your stories and how you got out of your situation as well so bye guys